So welcome everybody, super excited to be here today. Uh, We're going to be having an amazing panel about negotiating salary and your promotion and just everything that goes into effect with that, all the thought process behind that. I want to introduce my amazing panelists. So we have Jane Totova, who is the Vice President of Recruiting and Employment at Wedbush. We have Vanessa Holiday, who is the Senior Sales Manager at Amazon Web Services. And we have Emily Toledo, who is actually a Fulfillment Fund alum. She is a Corporate Financial Planning Analyst at the Walt Disney Company. And the great thing is that all these three amazing individuals are all in different parts of their career. And they're going to be able to really talk about how they've done it and what they've seen on their end. So Jane, do you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am a, a currently the Vice President of Recruiting and Employment for Wedbush Securities. Wedbush Securities is a full-service investment bank and a brokerage firm, so we're in the financial services industry. We have over 100 offices all over the United States. So in my role right now, I not only supervise the team, but I also help our internal employees make compensation decisions because compensation also falls under me as well. Um, prior to joining Wetbush, I worked for um, an, on the agency side as a recruiter. So my uh, salary at the time was commission-based salary. So I had experience negotiating that as well. And um, as far as my education goes, I got my undergrad degree from Cal State Fullerton and I got my graduate degree from Pepperdine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is We help early stage startups and VC backed game companies build a mobile, mobile and PC and console web uh, video games. So I, I really like the job. And because I'm in sales, I have very interesting experiences when it comes to total compensation packages and negotiating those um, to the point about commission that's in there, too, if you have any questions about that. Um, and what else? Oh, my education. So I got my undergrad degree at Virginia Tech. I'm a proud Hokie alumni, and I got my MBA at LSU. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Vanessa. I think you were getting a little cut off, um, but we were able to catch most of um, what you said. Uh, Emily, last but not least, do you mind just uh, telling us a little bit about yourself uh, and introducing yourself? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily. I'm a corporate financial planning analyst for the Walt Disney Company. I work for the Global Information Security Department. So I pretty much handle the finances of the people that are making sure that uh, the company doesn't get hacked. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, previous to that, I was a financial analyst for Raytheon in the aerospace divi division. So pretty much government contracts. And I got my undergraduate from UC Irvine. And like I said earlier, I am a fulfillment fund alumni from um, New Designs Charter School. So I'm going to start um, with just, I think, the, the first general question. Um, and it's, um, what research should someone who's looking to ask for an increase or promotion do? I think sometimes we don't realize that there is a bit of research that has to go behind it, right? You can't just like from one day to another and go and be like, hey, I want to I want to raise, I want a promotion. Um, so we'll start with Vanessa. Uh, what, what feedback do you have on just, like I said, research that you feel someone should do um, that's looking to, to take that next step? I think I heard uh, most of the question. Uh, just to repeat it back, um, what research someone should ask if they're looking for an increase or, or, or a promotion? There's a couple things. So I think um, understanding where the company is at currently and what you can bring to the company in terms of helping them reach their goals is important. Um, obviously, right now we're facing macroeconomic headwinds, but that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to get a salary increase. You just kind of have to know what's standing the company's in, where are they at reaching their goals, and how can you tie back your contributions meaningfully in a data-driven way to what they're doing? Um, and I would also say knowing what you're worth on the open market, like what are employees making that have similar responsibilities, job titles, job levels as you, um, both of those are important. Um, and so I think, you know, you may be more valuable to a company than the company is letting on and understanding what's going on in the open market is key to that. And I, I'm more than willing to drop some actual, you know, websites where you can find that information too pretty easily if I'm allowed to do that in the chat. Yeah, definitely. Any resources that you have to share, we, we, we'd love to have them. Um, and then Jane, same, same question. I know you also have an extensive background, both as, a, as an employee and an employer. Uh, so what research do you feel that should go into this, uh, making or kind of uh, pursuing a salary increase or a promotion? 
Um, yes. Um, so number one is know yourself, know your skill set, and know your position. Um, I think it's very important to be honest with yourself. If you're stepping into a role that you have zero experience, you need to understand that because it will directly affect your salary. Um, if you are already experienced, maybe you've worked in a position for a couple of years, understand what that position would pay in the open market. And um, similar to what Vanessa said, there's a couple of websites that I typically go to if I wanted to see um, what my position would be worth or what some other position is worth. And those websites would be salary.com and um, payscale.com. That's the ones that I trust and use. And you have to also remember that your level of education, number of years of experience, how many people, like if you are a client facing role versus a non-client facing role, all of that make a difference in terms of your salary. Another thing to consider is location. So if you are located in Los Angeles, typically that's about 15% higher than a national average. If you are located in New York, that's even higher. But if you are sitting in Arkansas, that's about 10 per, minus 10%. Mm -hmm. So location is equally as important. So knowing yourself, knowing what your position is, and knowing what your position is in the marketplace, those are, those that's the research that I would normally recommend doing. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and Emily, you actually bring in a very interesting perspective because you're quite new to this, right? You're 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 a fairly recent college grad, but I know in in our emails exchanges, you did mention that you 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 ultimately tried to negotiate your your salary. Um, uh, but uh, just on the, on the same topic, did you before you kind of made that decision and you know you were transitioning, did you do any type of research to kind of just figure out like, all right, what's what's my worth, what's my value, what what can what what kind of things can I negotiate? Yeah, so I pretty much did everything that Vanessa and Jane are recommending right now. I did my research. I looked on Glassdoor. I looked on LinkedIn to see the salary ranges that they were offering for the positions that I was applying to. And I was a little scared at first because I had only had, I was what, maybe two years out of college. So I wasn't sure what I could use to negotiate, but I had one one and a half years of experience under my belt. And one thing that I've taken from other friends that are a couple of years older than me is to just pretty much just negotiate, just always try to negotiate. I have nothing to lose. So it's pretty much just offering, putting myself on the table and seeing what they could offer. And I always thought to myself, the worst that they can tell me is unfortunately like, no, we can't, you know, offer, um, offer what you want. But, you know, at least I know that I tried and luckily it like worked, so. Oh, and, and that's actually kind of a good segue to my next question. So I'll just go ahead and start with you. Uh, you know, your your last time and your first time, your last time was the first time you, you tried negotiating, right? So tell us a little bit about that experience. How did that go? Uh, you know, like you said, the first time you tried and you're like, well, I, I don't even know if I have enough experience, but let me try it because like you said, the worst that they could say is no. So how did that go? Yeah, so it, it was actually pretty fast. So I, I got my offer letter um, and I was super excited to accept the offer, but I was talking to my friends and they were like, no, don't accept it right now. Just do your research, see if you can offer, um, off, sorry, ask for more money and see what they tell you. So I did my research. Um, I went on Glassdoor, LinkedIn, looked at the ranges, um, and then I drafted an email. Another thing, research how to write um, a negotiation email because that one could also be super helpful. So I expressed my interest for the job on top of, um, you know, I'm excited to take the offer right now, but I would love to know that if you could accommodate to a higher salary. And I told them the range that I was looking for. Um, so um, they got back to me pretty quickly. Unfortunately, they couldn't do a higher salary, but they were able to offer me a sign on bonus. So even though I couldn't get a higher salary, I at least got a, a bonus from that, which, um, you know, pretty much like, I didn't know that I, I could even get that. Um, so luckily, you know, at least I tried. And I expressed my interest in the job in the email. So it was a pretty good success for me, I would say. And now yeah, I know yeah. what to do for um, my next role if I ever am looking for one. Yeah, and that's awesome, right? You, you maybe weren't able to get that increase that you're looking for, but if had you not asked, you wouldn't have even got that sign on bonus, right? So that's like a huge win for you, especially for your first time doing it. So that, that, that's amazing. Congrats on that. Thank you. Um, and Jane, same same question, either maybe tell us when or about the first time that you need to try negotiating your salary um, or or just in general, you know, it could be a win or it could be maybe it didn't work out that myself, way. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, the, the surprising thing is the first time I negotiated my salary, 
uh, I didn't have access to all the tools and bells and whistles that you guys have right now, because that was many years ago. And I, my first job out of school was a commission-based job. So I got a small salary and commission. And um, while working two years for the same organization, I saw some great success. I, I got offered a higher level position, but since it's a commission job, you really, you make what you produce. So your commission directly depends on your output. Uh, so, but what I was able to negotiate and I told him, I was like, Hey, take my salary away. I'll make my salary may, way smaller, but give me a higher percentage of commission because I knew that my sales track record was really excellent. And I knew that by increasing that piece of the pie, it helped me uh, generate higher income. So that was the first time I tried to negotiate my salary and it worked out really well and, um, uh, made me a happy employee at the time. And that, that's, yeah, that's all. And you took a risk on yourself, right? Because I mean, if uh, for whatever reason you didn't sell, um, that was ultimately going to impact you. So the fact that you're willing to bet on yourself is awesome. And it sounds like it worked out for the best. Uh, thank you for sharing. And uh, Vanessa, same question. Do you mind telling us either about the first time or just in general, a time where you felt, uh, where you attempted to negotiate the salary and whether that worked out for you and just what you learned from it? Yeah, the first time I negotiated salary again dating myself was it was a long time ago, probably over a decade ago. Um, and it was successful like, moderately in that I think, you know, I they definitely was able to counter and get a little bit more than what they were offering from a base pay perspective. But as time went on, I started to learn and research um, to your point about having, you know, the information out there, right? As these tools become available, making sure that I was using them understanding the open market a little better. So when I came to Amazon, I really uh, fought a hard bargain. I understood what my walk away was. I was fortunate enough to already be employed at another company gainfully at that time um, and stuck to that, right? And we went back and forth. I went back and forth with them, maybe like two or three calls over the span of a couple of days. And I was a little nervous. So like, maybe I, maybe I pushed a little bit too hard, but they ended up coming back and, you know, giving me a dynamite sign-on bonus, a bunch of stock and it was just a much better offer than what I originally got. And so I would definitely say, you know, in the chat, it looks like we've all dropped some recommendations on places that you can get this information. Please, please do that. Um, these companies, I've seen it, especially now that I'm a manager and a hiring manager, a lot of them will really try to give you the lowest part of the pay band that they can, not to be disrespectful, right? Because they're trying to stretch out a budget. Um, let them let them do that to somebody else. Don't let them do that to you. Really try to respectfully push back and use that data on what you know about the open market and your skills and your responsibilities that you've had and your tenure. Uh, and again, your uh, place of work where you are high cost of living area like Los Angeles to, to fight back a little bit and get get what you deserve there. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, it's always a little scary, right? Because you don't know if they're what they're going to tell you, how they're going to react or um, are they going to get quote unquote offended? Are they going to rescind their offer? So so many different things start going through your mind. Um, but yeah, to your point, right? It's uh, it's just doing it and uh, doing your research and doing a uh, an offer that makes sense, right? That that that's that's respectful to a certain and not something that's extravagant to the point that they're going to be like, well, what is this person thinking? So definitely doing your research does pay off. And we um, we have a question in the chat, um, and the question is kind of along the lines we've been talking about and advocating for yourself, but what do you think helps motivate you to advocate for yourself when in doubt about your capabilities, right? Kind of uh, the theme essentially, right? Betting on yourself, um, you know, knowing that you might be doubting yourself. So any motivational words. So uh, does anybody want to take this one on? Is this, uh, uh, Vanessa, you want to start? So you're yeah, sure thing. I've been in a situation, especially in tech sales, it's, it's dominated by men, like most things are in this world. It's dominated by men. It's dominated uh, by white men specifically. And so I've seen as I've progressed in my career, I definitely look back and I was like, wow, was I underpaid compared to my counterparts that were on the same team as me, right? When I started to learn like, hey, this is what they were making. Um, and what really drove a point home to me, it was a book I was reading. And if I, if I remember it, I will drop it in the chat. But it was basically a book saying that like, hey, if you kind of operate the way the most privileged people in society operate in terms of what you think you're worth when you go to negotiate a salary, you will do better. Um, and I thought that, that was kind of a, a light bulb moment for me. And I talked to my husband about it. I'm, I, if anybody can't see me on the chat, because my chat video is a little grainy. Uh, I'm a female and I'm a biracial, but I identify as black. And my husband is a straight white male. And I told him this when I was reading this book. And 
he was like, well, yeah, like when I walk into a job interview, I assume that I deserve the best. I deserve this and I deserve that. And he's listing off all these things. And I was like, why, why do you deserve that? Like, you don't have, you know, your experience is great, but it's not what you're saying it is. And he was like, well, what the, what the worst they're going to do is tell you no. And he said, it's so matter of fact, like, I think he was like cooking or doing the dishes. And he said it just so offhanded that I think I started to realize like, wow, I have allowed my imposter syndrome to kind of take over um, and overshadow my capabilities and my aptitude. And so whenever I mentor people, especially in a role where I have a big team under me, I let them know that, like, please make sure that you're fact checking. And if that involves doing a 360 review where you're asking your peers and you're asking leaders and mentors, like, what are my strengths and what are my growth areas? Jot those down. Um, because sometimes when I see that on paper, I'm like, wow, I, I think these people think that I'm a lot better than I think I am. Um, so I think that's just a kind of a convoluted way of saying, make sure that you're, you're checking, checking the facts and not just how you might feel in the moment, because odds are that you are a lot more capable and deserve a lot more at work than what you're being given. Yeah, I think you, you touched on such a great point, right? Imposter syndrome. And I think we've all gone through that at one point or another, right? When are they going to realize that I'm a fraud and I don't know what I'm doing? Um, so that, that feeling definitely does take over. But to your point, right, we we sometimes don't give ourselves enough credit for, for the skills that we have. Um, Jane, do you, did you uh, want to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to echo exactly what you said is it's hard to let yourself, uh, you know, create all of these positives about yourself, the selling points and pat yourself on the back. And a lot of the times we are our own harshest critics. So if you are in the position of self-doubt, the best thing you could do is go and speak to your manager, go and have a conversation with your manager and say, how am I doing and what can I do better? And if your manager comes back and saying, wow, you are amazing as is, you're doing this and this and this, everything to the T, then this is the time where you can, you know, schedule another follow-up meeting and come back and say, hey, I, you know, I, I'm doing a great job because you told me that. And this, is, you know, I've done my research and, you know, I was wondering if there is an opportunity for me to start negotiating my salary and ask for a raise. And just remember that closed mouth doesn't get fed. If you don't ask for it, there's a chance that you're not going to receive it. Yeah, I love that expression. I, I use it all the time, right? Closed mouths don't get fed. So, uh, and then Emily kind of touched on this earlier, right? The worst they can tell you is no. Um, so that's definitely something that you have to keep in mind. So I do want to loop you back in, Emily, as well. Um, one of the questions on the chat that I feel you might be able to talk a little bit about since you are um, our most recent uh, alum, just fresh, a couple years out of college, is student asks, do you recommend to over-exaggerate your abilities a bit to make a stronger case or stick to being purely genuine? Um, and, you know, obviously this comes off when you're interviewing, when you're maybe even creating your resume, like how much you know, uh, how overzealous do you want to be versus, you know, that that balance of being genuine. So I'm not sure if you can maybe talk a little bit about that when you were applying for your first job and then when you're transitioning into your current role at, at the Walt Disney Company. Yeah, of course. So luckily when I was applying to my first job, it was a very introductory uh, job. And when I talked to the hiring team about this job, they told me that they were going to train me on how to do everything. So that was something that I wasn't really nervous about because I knew that I had some skills, just not all the skills. So I knew that this that my first job was pretty much going to be a stepping stone to the job that I actually wanted. So I was going to get all my skills from this one job and use that on my resume sorry, to pivot to future positions. So luckily that was great. And I learned as much as I could. I pretty much sharpened my Excel skills just because the positions that I was applying to or just interested in the future were all finance positions. So I already knew what I had to get to get to those future positions. Um, pivoting on to my future role, which is like the role that I'm in right now. I luckily at the time when I was applying, I had just gotten my one year review with my manager. So I was able to get all that feedback that I was getting from my job as well as from my colleagues. So I pretty much use that as motivations. It's like, if I'm already doing a good job and, you know, I've already got the feedback from my manager, what, you know, what else is there to improve on? And, um, 
sorry. So I pretty much use that as confidence. And as well, luckily at the time during my position, I was also teaching um, engineers how to pretty much do Excel stuff or finance stuff. So I was like, if I can explain this to someone that is in a non-finance position, you know, I already know I'm on ready for the next level of my of my career. So I knew that I was ready. And um, when talking about exaggerating, I always have to be realistic with myself and tell me if, if I lie, on my on my interview or resume it's like I'm gonna get caught so I know that I have to be confident in my abilities and know that when I'm interviewing I know what I'm doing I know what I'm saying and I can back it up when I actually get the job so that's something something from my perspective that I'm offering yeah no and I think that's a great point right because what if they call you out on it or what if you're like yeah I'm a wizard at excel and they're like oh that's great right you know how to do v lookups and you're like what like what the heck right so it's just like that's the last thing you want to do because then now you look like you lied and that's going to come off wrong and then you know it's going to leave a bad taste in the person that's interviewing they're like well if she's if she he or she's lying about this what else are they lying about right so that's the last first impression that you want to have so I think that's that's a great point so thank you thank you for sharing of course I think it's a good question. Do you think it's worth the risk of accepting an offer from like your dream job, dream company, but maybe the salary compensation isn't there? Uh, So uh, let's start with uh, Jane. So it's an interesting question because my, my, my follow-up question to that would be, did you try to negotiate the salary already? Because if you haven't tried to negotiate the salary, try There's a couple of things that it's very important to know, and especially now with the new pay transparency laws, did you guys know that uh, an employer is supposed to disclose the salary range for the position? So you can ask them what is the salary range for this role, and they have to disclose it, right? So um, I would recommend starting uh, at the point of negotiation. If you feel like there's absolutely zero room to negotiate, if they came to you and said, hey, this is the one and final offer, I think it is worth accepting a job from your dream job, dream company, because similar to what Emily said, you know, you're going to get your skill set there. You're going to learn, you're going to train, you're going to prove yourself in that job. And that could be a stepping stone for your next dream job. Um, So you have to look at it this way and you have to really be honest with yourself. What type of a skill set you're going to get? What type of experience you're going to get? And is this the company that you want to put on your resume and be proud of? Perfect. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, next question from the chat is, uh, is there a situation where it isn't a good idea to try negotiating your salary? Uh, can you think of a scenario where you're like, well, maybe at this point I should not uh, negotiate? So, uh, Vanessa, any thoughts on that? I can't think of any instance where it's not a good idea to negotiate. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. I've, I've seen it now from the other side. Like I, I was a salesperson before I became a sales manager. Highly recommend doing that, by the way. If you go into management, if you've done what you're managing, uh, it'll probably be a better experience. But I, I'm seeing now where they'll, they'll say all the time, oh, you know, there's just no room. There's no, no, no wiggle room. And then on the back end, they'll tell you, they're like telling the managers now, like, you know, we have an additional 50,000 we can play with here or there, or we can give them some more stock. So I've worked at a lot of big companies. And so I don't know about the smaller companies, but every single big company I've I've been at, there's room. Um, You know, there's there's times when they're going to come back and their best and final isn't what you probably want or you're happy with, but I would at least give it an initial shot. I can think of a scenario where you probably shouldn't negotiate a salary. It's Maybe if you've been written up or if you had a manager, if you had a conversation with your manager and your manager is like, you're really not keeping up with your workload. You're not doing the great job. This is a time where probably like this is not the right conversation at this point of time, Um, because remember, you got to get paid for what you're worth. And if your manager is talking to you about your performance, you probably need to consider that first before negotiating the salary. And I saw, Ivan, your question in regards to pay transparency laws. The pay transparency laws applies to everywhere in California, uh, New York, New Jersey, Colorado, and there's, I think, one more state. Um, but it's becoming very popular. So I, I'm waiting and see, like, I'm hoping that we'll see it throughout the United States soon enough. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. A lot of times we're asked, and then Jane kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. We've we're, we've been talking a little bit about when you're starting a new position, you know, negotiating your initial salary. But one of the things that can happen, you can be in a in a, the same organization and even the same position, and still have those conversations with your manager, with your supervisor, 
And um, it, I'm going to, uh, there's a question in the chat, but I'm going to kind of twist it a little bit. But essentially, it's like saying like, okay, well, now you're in that position. And maybe it, the question is, you're making sense of the average salary. Um, but what, what, what needs to go into effect for you to be comfortable to ask for, for an increase? So is it performance? Is it the time that you're working in that company? Um, you know, do you need to ask for a different title? Can you still have the same title and still get a promotion or an increase? Like what, what, uh, does, what goes into, into that? So, um, uh, let's, uh, Vanessa, do you want to take this one on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that when you're in role, um, demonstrating with data that you are regularly operating outside the scope of your position and your job level, specifically doing things that help your leadership team and the greater org drive towards their mission, scale, and be more efficient are great ways where even if you're not getting necessarily getting a title promotion, that you can get your pay increased. I know we do that pretty much every year at Amazon. Um, and it again goes back to understanding where the company is currently. Um, if their stock is blowing it out of the water and their cost of sales and stuff like that is really low, it's also a really good time to, to probably address this. I would say in terms of time of the year, performance review, if, if you work somewhere that does annual performance reviews, is probably the best time. Um, that's when most companies that you know I've worked at look at look at that. Um, but then it's, you know, if there's no room in the pay band to, to move up in your salary based on that particular job title, asking about, hey, you know, this is my track record. This is my performance track record. Is it time to look at a promotion or moving into another role? I personally am somebody who likes to keep the really strong talent in-house. Um, and so if that means moving them into an entirely different job family so I can keep them under the Amazon umbrella, that's what I want to do. And I will, I will listen to those conversations every single time. Yeah. And I think that's a great point, right? Because no good manager is ever going to want to let go of talent. They know that it's going to be a lot more of a headache, probably even more money to hire someone else, train them, invest all that time and effort when they already have an amazing employee and they don't want to lose them. So yeah, of course I think, yeah, they're, you know, many, many managers will make that call, but I'd rather pay them a little bit extra because in the end, I know that they're going to put that necessary output. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the things that, or one of the questions that is probably going to come up is salary expectations. I think that's usually when you're kind of applying for a job, they're going to, you might either have to enter it um, in the application itself, or maybe the HR manager reaches out and like, oh, well, what are your salary expectations? I think that question is always a little uh, intimidating. Like, well, what do I say? What do I ask? Uh, um, Emily, do you have any experience when uh, in either, either job of a uh, getting asked or having to talk a little bit about salary expectations as a, as a recent alum? Yeah. So for when I was applying for Raytheon, um, I wasn't really told the salary range until I got the job offer. So, which was like a base number that they couldn't change. And I was happy with it just because I knew that I didn't have much to bring to the table and it was my first like real job out of college. So, um, luckily it wasn't something that I wasn't like, um, well, how do you, call it like disappointed with so I was like oh, I'll just take it um I was like trying to remember what I what I told the HR person on the phone um but at first I actually asked them I was like can I um have the salary range for this position of what you're willing to pay me I already had a number in my head but I just wanted to know if my number was fitting with what they were going to offer me so once I got their range I was like okay well this is I knew that the they would give me the the base range and then the the higher range. So I was like, okay, well maybe you can um, squeeze me in for this number. So that's pretty much what I did. Um, and then when they gave me back the number, that's when I tried negotiating. And I was like, okay, well um, I actually did my research, and it turns out that my position actually gets paid this much. So if you can accommodate to that one, that would be great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, so are there certain fields that are not as prone to granting salary increase or promotions due to their budget? Uh, so for example, whether you're working at a nonprofit versus a tech industry or just any other organizations, and how would you, how would you go about having these conversations? I've only ever been in tech, so I probably can't answer this one effectively. I'm sorry. I, I will take this and um, again, I work in finance, so we're a little bit more diligent about that. But I think every company has a different approach to compensation and how they treat compensation. If you are in California, 
again, the new pay transparency law make things a little bit easier because your employer has to disclose the full salary range to you when you're interviewing for a position. That salary range has to be disclosed to you. The, they can disclose a hiring range versus the full salary range. So, um, and I think that uh, if you're already in the company, you know how the company is doing. You know how the company is doing and performing financially because a lot of the times you'll hear about layoffs. And when you're hearing about the layoffs, maybe this is not the right time to start um, shaking the boat and saying, I want more money. Um, but if the company is doing well financially, if you work for a public company, you could see the actual financial statements. So you could review the 10Ks and 10Qs and figure out how the company is doing and ask ask if there is a budget for promotion, ask if there is a budget for an increase. And a lot of the times the answer is yes. Also, where you fall in terms of that pay scale is entirely up to your skills experience. How many years have you worked? But an individual with a very similar skill sets can actually fall onto two different areas of that pay scale. So your job is to try to make your way towards the top of the pay scale. Um, and if you are already at the top of the pay scale, consider that you're potentially in the wrong position. You're in a position that's too low for you and it's time for a promotion. It's time to look for a step up in your career. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. that uh... That insight, Jane. Really do appreciate that. Um, all right, so let's go to another question. Um, so this is kind of operating backwards a little bit. So someone asked uh, if there's been a point in your job where your position ends up adding more work to what was initially described. Um, so at that point, so you kind of got the work front at first before asking for that promotion. So uh, is that well? How would you approach that conversation with your with your supervisor about uh, maybe asking for a higher salary or promotion without taking on more work because the work has already been placed on you without you necessarily asking for it. So how would you, uh, how would you recommend someone in that position? I'll take that one because I, I tried to answer it a little bit in the chat. Um, I think the answer is yes, you should pursue uh, probably a promotion at that point. Um, from what I've seen, at least the places that I've worked, companies will try to expand your scope of role till they can't do it anymore and you push back without giving you increased pay. So I think, you know, a tactical way to say that is something to the effect of, you know, I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have an enhanced scope of role the past six months, given how strong my performance has been during the time of, you know, what you've given me with these extra responsibilities and how I've helped you scale. I really would like to explore what a promotion track would look like. You know, can you help me understand a timeline for that and what that would entail. Um, oftentimes you're probably already operating at that level. And so it's really just a matter of, do they have the budget and the paperwork to do it, but definitely own that. Um, because at least at bigger companies, they will try to squeeze you until they can't squeeze you anymore. Awesome. And I know you kind of try to answer a Bell's question as well about increase versus uh, position. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that as well, Vanessa? Yeah, and Jane kind of touched on it a little bit, but basically what I was saying was that um, he, he was basically asking whether it makes sense to go for an in-roll pay bump or to pursue a promotion. Uh, and generally, from what I've seen, at least in tech, going for a promotion will um, net you higher compensation in the medium and long term than just doing an in-roll pay bump. Obviously, that's not always an opportunity that you have. You probably can't get a promotion every single year. Um, but I would definitely try to push for that promotion, especially if, like we were just discussing, your enhanced scope of your role is already bleeding into that next level of job family. You should certainly ask for that promotion because um, the pay band is most likely going to be higher. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And can one I other, another thing in, in, uh, really sorry, quickly on, on the same question. Um, market adjustment salary increases can be looked at different than merit increases. And a lot of the times, if you get a market adjustment throughout the year, you still are eligible for a merit increase. If you got a promotion or a merit increase that is out of cycle, you may no longer be eligible during the in-cycle increase. So um, you need to ask yourself the question, what are you asking for? Are you asking for a promotion? Are you asking for a market adjustment? So if you've done your research and you, you have the data to prove that, hey, I feel like I'm getting underpaid for the role that I'm doing, 
and you're asking for a market adjustment, then you would still be eligible for merit increases when they come around. So something to consider. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Jane. Um, and um, uh, it's been mentioned somewhat already, but normally we think of promotion, we think of salary, we think of uh, of just the, the increase itself, right? But there are other benefits that a company or an organization can offer you. Um, so I want to start with Emily because I know you mentioned about um, the sign-in bonus. But um, in addition to that, were there any other uh, like just benefits in general that attracted you to the Walt Disney Company, whether that was the retirement plan, uh, the vacation time, or all these other things that obviously you take into consideration when considering a new job? Um, yeah, so I definitely looked at pretty much like the name was what attracted me to apply to the job posting. Um, but other than this is something that I found out when I got the offer. So if you do end up working for Disney on like the corporate side, they do offer you free entrance to the park. They also give you free comp tickets. So you can, so I can bring in three people every time I go in the park, you just have to like reserve through the website. Um, and then they also told me that I was getting access to like the Disney plus combo. So all of those were like a couple benefits that um, the employees get. The Disney plus combo was recently, they just added that this year, but that was something that I pretty much didn't know about it until um, they told me about the offer. So I was like, oh, that's perfect. And on top of that, I, I consider these regular benefits that any company should offer. So it wasn't something that um, caught my attention, but it was pretty much pay time off and uh, self-care. Um, I that those are something that I value and they pretty much call it like family care. So if you have to take care of family, they give you two weeks um, of like pretty much pay time off, which is separate from your um, PTO that you earn. So I had like two weeks of extra self-care on top of the P, uh, PTO that I was earning throughout my time here. Um, and then on top of that, they give me... Um, I believe, I forget what they're called, but they're like little, I think like two days of holidays that I can use whenever um, in the entire year. So I pretty much, I believe had about like three weeks of uh, vacation time that was offered to me when I joined the company. Awesome, thank you. You're gonna have uh, everybody trying to get your best friend for the free Disneyland to <laughs> send yeah. that publicly, myself included. No. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And actually, Emily, what you just mentioned, it doesn't get offered to everybody. There are companies that do not offer PTO. There are companies that do not offer these self-care days of floating holidays. So um, it, it, that's one of those things that you absolutely need to look at as a total package. In addition to those, definitely take a look at the 401k. Um, sometimes like our 401k, not only do we have a matching contribution, we also have profit sharing contribution. So there's two different contributions. So that additional, I mean, I think my, my contribute, my employer contribution into my 401k was 16,000 last year. That's 16,000 of free money that you didn't have to really do anything. In addition to the 401k, look at the cost of the benefits because you're going to need medical benefits. Are the medical benefits free or do they cost an arm and a leg? Because that's going to be direct cost to you. Um, one of the things that Wedworth doesn't cover is parking. Like that's another cost that you need to consider into the compensation. Um, it's definitely not a perk, but if the company does offer parking, you should consider that as well. And some of the other things that you can negotiate is sign-in bonus. Um, you can negotiate equity. Not a lot of people think about that, but that's one of those things that if you're working for a public company, you need to start negotiating equity and how much stock options the company will give you. And sometimes even private companies will give you equity. Awesome. And that's a good chance. That was actually my next question for Vanessa. I think you mentioned that, that you got some, some shares, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about what that process was like? And just for those that aren't familiar with that, just what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my situation, um, because I'm in sales, we have our base salary, we have our commission, and then um, working at Amazon, we have uh, stock, right? R restricted stock units, RSUs. And I've seen it uh, very widely based on, you know, your role, your experience, your level, when you come in, how many they give you and the onset. Um, and when I pushed back originally, when we were talking about, you know, me negotiating, um, I wanted a higher base salary than what they were going to give me, a much higher base salary, actually. 
they came back and they were like, well, we can bump the base salary a little bit, but not to what you want, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw in a ton of additional shares. They're just not going to invest until, I don't know, your second or third year at Amazon. To me, I was like, hey, that's that when I did the math, um, it made sense longer term because I knew that that share price was going to continue to go up, up and up. Um, so that's something you really want to think about when you're looking at uh, negotiating RSUs. Like, How much is that stock worth? What is this company's trajectory? Do you think that that stock is going to continue to go up? Is it going to flatline or is it going to go down? Sometimes that's obviously hard to predict with things like COVID and stuff. But for the most part, you should have a good sense of that um, and try to push for as many as you can. And then, you know, go back to the table. You know, when you go for your performance review, don't just let them rest on their laurels of what they gave you when you started. Try to get more and more each year, uh, as long as your performance and your track record shows that you deserve it. Great, thank you. And uh, someone in the chat kind of you made me think about it because you said a little bit about COVID, which is, right. Uh, I, I think I talked to all of you, you were talking about how you were working remotely now, so times have changed. Um, and just speaking about what you can negotiate, so someone on the chat asked um, if, um, you know, going from in-person to uh, an office, can you negotiate maybe getting paid for travel time or uh, for mileage, for gas um, versus maybe getting that increased salary? Have any of you maybe had that experience um, where someone maybe were compensated um, because in right, right first last couple of years we had to work from home and now maybe you have to go into the office a couple of times or maybe just what that looks like. So I, I work in human resources, so we, we create policy around it all the time. And I can't speak to what other companies are doing, but I could tell you that if you are going to the office as part of your job, you typically do not go. That travel time is not compensable time if this is part of your regular job. However, if you normally work from home but are asked to go into the office every now and then, that could be compensable time. You can then, um, you know, you can then expense your mileage. You can then expense your parking. But if you are asked to go back to the office as a regular employee and that's your normal status now, um, typically it's not something that would be compensated back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, but other than the salary, anything else that you all would feel um, would be a great benefit to consider when considering job options? Oh, yeah. So I just thought about this right now. So one thing that I found out that Disney does is that I believe if you're trying to pursue additional education on top of your undergraduate, they can pay for some of it. So I found this out from talking to my other colleagues. So he did his MBA at UCLA and he got, I think, 40 percent of his costs paid for from the Disney company. And I believe if you stay a certain amount of time after completing your, um, for example, your MBA at Disney, I believe he, like he's still there. So I think if you stay at Disney a year after you complete your MBA, you don't have to pay it back. Tuition wow. reimbursement. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's um, different companies offer different levels of tuition reimbursement, and it just depends on what your company offers, but it is definitely one of the benefits that should be considered because you can work for a company that offers zero, or you can work for a company that offers $10,000 per year that you can use towards continued education. Awesome, yeah, thank you both. And I think that's a huge perk, right? Um, getting getting your, your, your graduate program essentially sponsored, that's, that's, that's a huge, huge asset. Uh, Vanessa, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say tuition reimbursement as well. Um, and I don't have kids, but one thing that I'm told constantly by my friends with kids is places that offer childcare cost reimbursement or even total coverage. That's a game changer um, with how inflation is right now. And from what I'm hearing, one of my friends told me that her <laughs> daycare costs more than her mortgage every month. That is one you should definitely look into if you're planning to have children or you have children. Um, and then another one I would say when we're talking about healthcare benefits, that's your point, Jane, is so important as now we're realizing with, with all this illness and stuff, but looking at things like life insurance coverage, right? And, and on the job injury coverage, those things matter. Um, I didn't really value that as much when I was younger, but now that I'm getting older, I, I'm starting to realize why that's important. So please make sure you're, you're looking into that. I know at my company, they have like a pretty good policy for all of us. And I think we pay like a dollar or $2 a paycheck. It's something silly. So um, look into the, look into all that for sure. Great. Yeah. That, that, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, just to echo or piggyback on what Vanessa, what Vanessa said, right. 
you don't think about that when you're a recent grad, but make sure that, you know, you take advantage of what your company is offering, your 401k, your 403b, even if you're doing like a minimal, um, the minimum, the most minimal amount, it makes a difference, right? Just, so just make sure that as, even if you feel you can't do it a lot, just 1%, 2%, whatever you feel you can donate at the time or, you know, contribute at the time is going to make a huge difference and you, you'll, uh, you'll be happy you did it after. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, we only have a few minutes left, so maybe about two more questions in, is um, we haven't really talked too much about timing. And I think um, depending on the company that you work for, timing can be important, right? Because right, Vanessa kind of mentioned, sometimes companies do have uh, wiggle, you know, money to play with. They're like, oh, wait, we have a, you know, this 50,000 or whatever. But sometimes you just have a super tight budget, especially maybe you're a smaller company and you're not able to kind of just, you know, get it from other places. Um, so does anybody want to talk a little bit about what would be the right time, if any, to ask for, for this increase, for this promotion, uh, you know, based on the company that you're working for? I can take that. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you, it depends on the organization. If you work for a larger, more structured organization, they typically have cycles, right? So you have a performance review cycle, which is typically followed by a merit cycle. Um, if you know that your company has that, probably asking right before it doesn't make sense. Wait till you go through performance review, make sure your performance is up to par and then go through the merit cycle. And um, hopefully you'll get what you want. However, if your company is not nearly as structured as that, um, then I would say, you know, depending on your role, if you feel like the role that you were hired to do has significantly expanded and you were given additional responsibility and you continue being able to perform at a right level with additional responsibilities, that could be the right time to ask for a raise. If you feel like you are currently doing the role that you were hired to do, um, then I would say maybe perhaps wait for a year mark until you've done your year or almost close to a year, you could start having those conversations. Um, I've had people come in into my office and they were like two months into their job. Two months is too soon. You are still in the learning period. You're still uh, getting your feet wet. You don't know the scope of the job. Um, at the point of time where you feel like you completely understand the scope of the job, you're able to contribute and make a difference in that job. That's a good time to ask for a raise. Perfect. Thank you. And you kind of killed two birds with one stone. That was another question on the chat of when is it too soon? So thanks for that, Jane. Um, another one, and I, I don't know, we haven't, we've been talking a lot about the positive, right? Like, okay, that's great. When you get a promotion, when you get a, a pay bump, when you get a sign-on bonus, when you get shares, but it's not always going to be, I, I assume that no one is batting a hundred, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to um, an increase. So what one, if you don't mind, just if either some of you don't mind sharing just the, the like what happens if a company just denies it? Like, what do you what do you feel or what have you done after the fact if they say, hey, you know what, just either whatever they said, either not right now or we just not in our budget or, you know, that conversation that maybe they had with you. Um, and then following on the last question, just kind of trying to lump them together is um, if they're constantly denying you, when should you consider to leave? So kind of a bit of a two part question. I'll jump in there. Um, I always want to understand what the reasoning is. And I think I've been pretty fortunate that most of the times I understand um, where the where the merit pay is coming and, and where the cost of living adjustment, where that's coming from and how my performance ties to it. Um, so I think that's important, just understanding why, you know, right now being in a recession with these macroeconomic headwinds, I know a lot of companies either aren't doing as much of a bump, you know, this year for, for some of their employees, or they might be doing nothing at all. Um, so that's to be expected. If we fast forward two years and it's still the case and the company's booming and the economy's booming, I have questions about that. Um, and then to the point about if they keep denying it, if, if you're getting denied promotion year over year over year, and you feel like your performance isn't tied to that, that it's something else, I personally would be exploring other options. And honestly, it's it's always good to be exploring other options regardless. Even if you feel like you're in a great spot compensation wise and you're happy at your job, never turn down other offers. Like if folks are reaching out on LinkedIn recruiters and it's something that sounds promising, at least listen to what they have to say. Um, Cause sometimes there's always better offers out there, but definitely if it's year over year, you're getting denied, maybe start evaluating what your other options are. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. So we are almost out of time. So basically, final words of advice from each of you. Emily, do you want to kick us off? Uh, as a recent alum, right, you're 
you just graduated a couple of years ago, and I know you're still uh, kind of getting familiar with this whole process. But so far, it sounds like you've had some good experiences and you've had some, um, you know, a couple of good jobs. So just uh, any words on an advice for some of our college students that are a little nervous about uh, taking on that next step in their career? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, never. The worst, I always tell myself the worst thing that they can do is say no. And I, of course, am lucky that I have a great support system that, you know, every time I doubt myself, um, they're always there to give me support and confidence that sometimes I feel like I don't give myself because I know I'm a very harsh critic of myself. And another thing is it's like, you know, sometimes I'm like, maybe I'm overthinking a lot. And it's like, sometimes it's not that serious. Um, but once again, like I've been calm, sorry, I've been lucky enough that, you know, I get really good at stuff that I'm doing. And that gives me confidence because it's like, if I can do this job, what is stopping me from doing more? Um, and another thing is that, um, one thing that I recently learned about this week, unfortunately, because my lead is leaving, uh, salary transparency. That is something that I learned about and I was like, okay, so now I know how much he's making. So when I ask for my promotion, if they um, under, you know, undersell me, I know that, you know, I'm going to have to start looking somewhere else. So, you know, always talk about like your salary. I, because I know, um, you know, especially with my friends, when they try to negotiate in the salary, I'm like, no, you should be asking for this. And I will do the research for them and help them to make sure that they get what they deserve. Um, and all of just like that, you know, I don't know. I just work on confidence and just like that and always reach out to people on LinkedIn. That's what I did. So, you know, if, if I ever question myself, then I'll reach out to a, someone that works in the position that I want to be in and, you know, just ask them stuff that I, I sorry, I'm like ranting um, that I may be in doubt of. So, you know, it's never bad to ask for advice. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and normally people are, are uh, always looking or willing to help. Right. It's really rare that you find someone that's not going to give you a piece of advice because uh, they've known that they've been in that position before. So thank you so much, Emily. Uh, Vanessa, final words of advice for our students? Yeah, I would say know your worth and stick to it. That sounds probably pretty cheesy, but um, as somebody who has a lot of imposter syndrome to sink in, as I've gotten older, I've realized I, I wish I could go back and tell my younger self that. So please do that. Um, I'm definitely a visual learner. So for me, it always helps to have it up on my computer screen when I'm interviewing or on a piece of paper, just like some bullet points that I want to make sure that I hit home about, you know, my previous performance at other companies, my skill set, my education, so that when I am counter negotiating um, with these recruiters and these hiring managers, that I'm giving data as to why. And I think that that's super important. Awesome. Yeah. And we, uh, positive syndrome is real. And I think we all go through it at one point or another. So don't feel weird or intimidated or scared. It, it happens to all of us. It's just like right, building that confidence and ultimately knowing that you, you can do that role and you're there for a reason. It was no accident. Um, you know, you're, you're there because you can do the job. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, Jane, any final word, words of advice? Absolutely. And I'll say it again, know your worth and don't be afraid to ask for what you are worth. Make, do your research and importantly, make friends with your manager, right? And I'm not saying make friends with them. You don't need to be best friends with them, but you need to have a good relationship to be able to have tough conversations with your manager, to be able to openly discuss compensation with your manager. And if your manager is not in a position where they can discuss that, make friends with your HR department because somebody on that HR department will be able to sit you down and coach you and help you with understanding how salary works within that organization. Awesome. Thank you all so much, Jane, Vanessa, Emily. We really appreciate all your amazing insight and just great tips and pointers. But with that being said, thank you all so much. Once again, Jane, Vanessa, Emily, I appreciate all your help and for volunteering for this. Thank you all so much. And students, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed this webinar. Take care and have a great rest of your evening. Bye.